All right, Ellen, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ellen, and I'm just going to play a few different pieces for you this morning. The first one is called Bersus, and it's by a Russian composer named Reinhold Glier. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, welcome to the uh, 225 or so that have joined us so far. Um, uh, we'll be getting started with the program in, per in just a few minutes, but um, I wanted to introduce you to our, to our violinist today, Ellen Cochran Riccio. Ellen is the principal second violin of the Richmond Symphony, and she will provide some entertainment for us today as we're getting settled, and when she uh, is has finished a couple of pieces, then I will tell you the rest of her story. Ellen? Thank you. The, the next piece is by a slightly more famous Russian composer, Tchaikovsky, and it's simply called Melody.
The last piece I'm going to play for you this morning is by the one of the great violinists of the 20th century, um, Fritz Kreisler. He was born in Vienna in the late 1800s, and he was just an incredibly charming violinist, and he wrote a lot of his own music, and this is one of those pieces. It's called Schön Rosmarin. Thank you, Ellen. Um, as I mentioned before, Ellen, uh, this is Ellen Cochram Riccio. She's the uh, second violinist, uh, principal second violinist for the uh, Richmond Symphony. And about two weeks ago, I heard about Ellen and her backyard violinist concept. And uh, where, where, since then, I've gotten to know her and realized that she wasn't just a classical violinist, but she's a classical entrepreneur too. Uh, she was appointed to the Richmond Symphony in 2009, just after graduation. And then uh, as a young member of the symphony, she saw the need to find future audiences, the, the people that she was seeing at dinner and at, at, in the weekends, uh, a, a way to get them in, more involved so there would be an audience for the symphony in the future. And so she formed a nonprofit called Classical Revolution RVA to bring live music venue to restaurants and uh, live music, classical music to venues like restaurants and clubs and art galleries. Uh, and to develop a future audience. Then she participated in multiple TEDx presentations. She published an educational sh show for the string quartet narrator called 80s American Adventure. In 2014, she was named the Style Weekly's 40 Under 40, and I think she'd have also qualified for 30 Under 30. Uh, and now with talent on her hands because of the current environment, her creative thinking led her to become an entrepreneur. And she started providing personal concerts in outdoor and uh, virtual venues like this one. Uh, you got a hint of that today, and I, I hope you find her work inspiring and enjoyable, and uh, we'll give her a call in the near future. Uh, she's the future of, uh, of um, performing arts and music in, in Richmond. Uh, it won't take her long to get busy, so I suggest you do it as soon as possible. So. Her contact information is on the screen, and I hope you'll join me in rewarding her hard work and entrepreneurial spirit. And, and I look for places she could play for your business or personal event. Thank you again, Ellen. We really appreciate Thank it. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's get started with our program. I'm Stan Maupin. Um, welcome to the Entrepreneur's Second Virtual Breakfast. Um, it's our 83rd breakfast, and uh, normally I'd tell you this about how many venues we've been to, but instead I'll just say that this is our second virtual one. And I'm really pretty amazed by the response. Uh, we had um, uh, 
over 400 registrations, um, and it was the second most registrations we've had for an event. Uh, and, and since um, uh, we had uh, a little over 500 for Abigail Spanberger in January of 19. One of the things that I've noticed uh, that 85% of the people who are attending today have been to at least one meeting before. And that makes me feel good about uh, our, our, that we're, we're bringing something people want. More than 50% of you have been to six meetings or more. And uh, I'd like to thank the 85% that uh, have returning, but also the 70 new people. I hope you'll enjoy it today and we'll see you again. And thanks to all of you for continuing on us with this new path, and we'll try to keep it interesting and see where we can go with it. Yeah, a couple of announcements about um, uh, Zoom. Um, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, it'll be on our website soon, uh, and uh, we'll send you a link when it is. Uh, and you may have noticed that you've been muted, and that's not because we don't want to hear from you. It's to avoid issues like background noise from 300 or more uh, computers. Uh, you can chat one on one with individuals and you can also uh, chat with everyone, uh, post to everyone on the side and uh, most of you are probably familiar with that. And uh, when the speaker starts, you can send your questions to us uh, using the chat and uh, Nancy Everhart will be collecting them and, and we'll be giving them, uh, collating them and curating them and giving them to Bob at the end. And uh, I, um, now I'd like to thank a few people that have helped us get where we are, the supporting entrepreneurs. There are uh, 68 who have signed up for today and I thank you for your support. I'm sorry I can't do what I usually do and ask you to stand, but uh, know that we appreciate it. Um, uh, um, another sponsor that you'll hear more about later or you'll be uh, hear from later is Nancy Everhart with Pathwise Partners. And uh, she's a great supporter of Uncorpreneur, literally from the beginning, and a great asset to Richmond's community. And I recommend her book, Uncommon Candor. Uh, she's at pathwisepartners.com. And Fahrenheit Advisors is, uh, is our, our uh, uh, major sponsor as well. Rich Reinick and Keith Middleton, I've known them, known them longer than I care to admit, and probably than they would. And, uh, is, and I couldn't be prouder that they think enough of Uncorpreneur to ask me to hang out in their offices. Uh, there are uh, eight or nine members of the Fahrenheit team are registered today. And uh, to you guys, I'm sorry, I've missed seeing you at the office every day. I'm glad you're here. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to recognize Gary LeClaire. Is, is Gary on? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, Gary, can, can we unmute him and just say hi? Maybe, maybe later. Just, just one second. Okay. Dan, I'll say, the, I'll say hi. By the yeah, way, the music was wonderful, and uh, what a great way to uh, take advantage of, uh, of a, a bad situation with COVID-19, but still keep the group together. So well done, Stan and Nancy. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Gary. All right, uh, is Frank on board? Frank Dufton? I, do I, don't, I don't see him stand. Okay. Well, um, I, uh, my guess is that uh, either something came up or he's struggling with the technology. Hey, Stan, I'm here. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, most, many of you might have seen uh, Dr. Gupton on his last meeting in, August, in April. Uh, he dropped some hints about a big announcement that would ho hopefully be coming down the road. And you probably read about that in New York in the Richmond.com, Forbes, New York Times, or saw it on one of the major news channels. The startup he, he co-founded 13 years after he retired to the beach in Virginia Beach was just awarded a $354 million project to build a strategic national reserve of essential, uh, uh, of essential medications and help uh, uh, manufacture those in a more efficient and, and uh, U.S.-centric way. And Frank's here for just a few minutes to tell us about, what, about the event and what it means to the region. Frank? Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, First of all, when Stan called me this week after the, the news broke on this uh, award from uh, BARDA and, uh, and uh, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, uh, he told me that I'd be preceding Bob Holdsworth. And uh, Bob's probably the, one of the main reasons why I'm back at VCU. He was part of a team that had this crazy idea about bringing this guy from industry into academia. 
and uh, stirring the pot. So Bob, many thanks for, for all of that. The other thing I, I noticed is I, I see two old friends of mine, Franklin Boss and Brad Booker. Uh, they represent two ends of the spectrum for me. Brad and I played basketball against each other in high school and they're golf buddies now. And, and Franklin's one of my colleagues over at VCU uh, College of Engineering. Uh, so uh, Stan, thanks again for reaching out to me. I know we talked last time, for those of you who heard my, uh, my presentation on what we were doing with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to try and um, increase access to global health drugs and also to kind of talk about some of the challenges that we're faced with in the current supply chain. Uh, as Stan said, I, I was kind of hoping that the news would break last month instead of this month so I could have talked about it. But fortunately, um, we got, uh, uh, had been working on this project for about a year and a half. It was long before COVID-19 hit. And it was an, an idea about how vulnerable our US supply chain was with regards to uh, um, uh, national health care. And uh, we had been discussing with the White House since probably November of last year about this issue because it kind of related back to the, uh, the um, tariff uh, constraints that the U.S. was putting on China and the concern that there would be retribution and, and holding back drugs from, uh, through the healthcare supply chain. And then things accelerated very rapidly with the COVID-19 problem. And uh, so what we came up with is what we think is an end-to-end -end solution for bringing pharmaceutical manufacturing back to the United States. I have uh, several partners. I'm part of a group. Uh, the group's being led by, um, by my friend, Eric Edwards, who's the CEO of a company that we've stood up called Flow Corporation. And the flow, uh, uh, the meaning for that is uh, associated with flow chemistry and continuous pharmaceutical manufacturing. The idea being is that we're not only dependent upon the drugs that we consume in China, but also the active ingredients that are produced to make the drugs, as well as the building blocks that are used and the starting materials that are used to make the active ingredients. So what we're doing is we're repurposing a, a facility down in Petersburg that was purchased a, a few years ago by a company in California called Anpac uh, the, 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 uh, to transform the capacity in that facility to make the building blocks that will then supply a new manufacturing facility on the same site that will then convert those starting materials into the active ingredients and, and co-located on that site will be another partner uh, uh, called Civica RX. And I, I think I spoke about that last month. Civica is a nonprofit pharmaceutical company that is making, uh, that is procuring all the uh, drugs to be able to support the major hospital systems in the United States. The, uh, they have over 1,500 hospitals, including uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, Mass General, uh, uh, Catholic Hospitals in the United States, HCA and all and Kaiser Permanente, all these major hospitals, we will be setting up a strategic reserve much in the same way that we have a strategic oil reserve. Uh, uh, but this will be for healthcare and that'll be also located down in Petersburg. And then uh, we'll make the active ingredients and then the, as needed, they will be rapidly converted uh, to the finished dosage product in the event that we have a COVID-19 incident but also in parallel, we'll be supplying uh, major hospitals in the United States with drugs on an unmet need basis. Right now, about 20% of our operating room capacity in the United States is being lost because they don't have the drugs to be able to support those procedures. So hopefully this is gonna address a lot of that problem. And we're very fortunate to be doing it in Virginia. And what we believe is this will become kind of an epicenter for um, for uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing technology for the 21st century. And Bob's been really egging me on to, uh, to get involved uh, with uh, the uh, state funding with Go Virginia. And finally, we got that passed this year too. So Bob, many thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Frank. I really appreciate it. And um, as I said, you I've got you down as committed to uh, coming and speaking to us and telling us more as this grows. We look Very forward. good. Thanks, Dan. One, one question. Um, uh, what do you see long-term in terms of jobs and things like oh, that? Oh, that's a good question. 
uh, these are not just jobs, these are careers. These are, these are really great opportunities with highly technical people coming in. And the projection is that it'll bring approximately 350 jobs directly working in this space I think what's really exciting to me, Stan, is I think that there's going to be a whole lot of secondary and tertiary industries that are going to be built up around this. Uh, uh, I was just on the phone with, uh, with uh, the folks from uh, Rutgers and Purdue, and we're in the process of creating uh, this multi-institutional center of excellence for pharmaceutical manufacturing. And uh, they, uh, I think, you know, money is a great lubricant for collaborations. And uh, so when they heard that we had all this money, that uh, they made us the head of the API division of this National Center of Excellence. So uh, it's going through uh, Congress right now. And I'm glad you mentioned this because uh, Abigail Spanberger uh, co-sponsored the bill in the House for this Center of Excellence. And it's going into the Senate uh, uh, next. And I think it'll get passed fairly quickly. Uh, but uh, Senator Warner will be um, uh, sponsoring that uh, co-sponsoring that bill with Senator Blackburn. And so what this will do is, you know, um, um, I think what it, I'm hoping it'll do is create this um, uh, awareness, uh, this national awareness of what's going on of uh, um, uh, here at VCU with regards to how we're working on addressing this whole national healthcare supply chain. It was funny, I, one of my colleagues sent a uh, a, a, a notice out on this. Uh, 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 I'm not really good at advertising, but uh, a lot of others are at VCU, and they sent uh, the uh, uh, this a broad area announcement to uh, all the universities in, in uh, chemical engineering programs in the United States about uh, the, the the funding that we got. And uh, my my uh, the chair at UVA uh, sent me a a one word uh, reply to that, and it was. Yowza. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, uh, I think uh, Bill knows that we're, we're, we're working, we're looking over their shoulders, and, but we want to work and, and kind of raise the, uh, uh, have all boats rise with the tide on this. So I think it's going to be great for the state. Great. Well, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks. Sam. Okay. Right. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, uh, Ro Dr. Robert Bob Holdsworth. He uh, has a 30-year career at VCU, where he was founding director of the Center for Public Policy, and he directed the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs. Twelve years ago, he, be he began his uncorporeal unco career and, and became a speaker on Virginia and national politics, and his observations on, na on, on, on that politics have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, the New York Times, and many other places. In 2009, he, he joined Decide Smart, a public policy consulting firm. And then this spring, uh, confined to the home by the, by the pandemic, pandemic, he's used his research and public policy expertise to develop a daily Facebook report analyzing Virginia-based data on COVID-19, uh, exploring, uh, uh, and, it's, and he's exploring the personal and policy choices that the disease has raised and hopes that this uh, um, daily reporting will be part of a, a, a book on uh, related topics in the future. So, um, uh, Dr. Bob Holsworth. Um, Stan, uh, thanks very much, and thanks everybody for being here. It's uh, somewhat daunting following a, a superstar like Frank Gupton, and I've never had to follow um, a soloist from the R uh, Richmond Symphony. Um, I kind of feel like Mick Jagger did on his uh, first American tour when he was asked if he would do anything differently. And he said uh, he'd never make Tina Turner the opening act again uh, on that front. Um, so what, what I'd like to do today is really um, three quick things. Uh, first, I wanna chart a little bit about the COVID landscape in Virginia, uh, what happened and what hasn't happened uh, since the outbreak started, the pandemic started here. Uh, secondly, I want to talk a little bit about the phase that we're moving into right now, which I call um, uh, social distancing 2.0. And at, at that point, we're going to ask everybody to take a very brief survey that uh, Stan and I have put together. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of the, the challenges going forward, and in particular, the way, at least in recent weeks, I think, 
uh, the whole debate over COVID has become politicized and into the partisan polarized environment. And I'm gonna show a little data about how that is actually happening as well. So, so let me just begin uh, by talking about sort of the landscape in Virginia. And, and the way I might wanna do this, however, is uh, by thinking through a couple of the uh, most searing early images that occurred from other states. Uh, the first image that I recall comes out of uh, Kirkland, Washington, where, as you might recall, there, the uh, Sunrise Senior Living Center out there uh, was devastated uh, by and ravaged by COVID. And you might recall those uh, extraordinary images of people uh, standing outside the, the, um, the facility, banging on the windows, trying to uh, have some kind of communication and contact uh, with their loved ones who are in the facility while they didn't know what was happening. Um, and soon after that, even that image was superseded by what happened in New York City, where all of a sudden we were watching um, these hospitals overrun with COVID patients. Every time you turn on the television, you would see the empty streets of New York filled with ambulances and the sirens uh, screaming through the streets. Um, and then all of the stories and all of the um, commentaries and all the videos we saw of the emergency rooms per se. And so those were, were, were two big images early on. And my sense is, is that as Virginia began to think about how we were going to respond to this, um, and we, we came a little bit late to the, to the pandemic. Washington was first, New York was second. And now we were watching about how we were going to respond. And basically what happened is I think by and large, the response of Virginia and many other states was shaped by exactly what was happening in New York. We were very worried about having a hospital system that would be overtaxed. We would be very worried about tremendous community spread, people getting it in all the neighborhoods. And so what we did like many other states is that we instituted um, a basic economic lockdown uh, that you might call social distancing 1.0, uh, that essentially we closed all non-essential businesses, the schools and colleges closed, uh, and we tried to ensure that the interactions that people would have um, from one to another uh, were very, very minimal um, at best, and particularly for those people who could uh, and lived in circumstances where they could socially distance. And that had, uh, I think, and I'll, I'll go over this a little bit later again, very, very positive effect. It stopped a lot of the community spread. You didn't see it spreading from neighborhood to neighborhood uh, in Virginia. But what happened is that as we were focused on maintaining the hospital capacity, and as we were focused on uh, ensuring that we didn't have community spread, we may have forgotten a little bit about what happened in Kirkland, Washington, because that was, in, in essence, where this uh, disease first ravaged Virginia tremendously. Uh, it went into the long-term care facilities um, across the state. And while the hospitals were fairly well prepared, the hospitals never reported um, that they were overtaxed with patients. In fact, they were underutilized. The hospitals never reported that they had sufficient PPE problems. All of a sudden, what occurred in Virginia was the long-term care facilities were really hit very, very hard. And what I'd like to do is to, uh, if I can get to the share screen here, which I think I am, um, just show you what happened in terms of a, a first chart about you know, who has been hit in Virginia and who has essentially had the biggest problems. And what you see is that uh, in terms of cases and deaths in Virginia, while the cases, um, you know, are fairly evenly distributed with the largest numbers being people in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, the people who have died in Virginia have been the 60s, 70s, and 80s, about, um, <clears throat> you know, 52% of the people who have died of over the 1,100 people are, are over 80, about another 25% are seven, 79. And what we found 
is that half of the people who died in Virginia were in the long-term care facilities. And um, what I would say was that this was a place where we really um, were late in responding uh, by and large. And in fact, we're simply still responding um, in the long-term care facilities. This has been um, a place where we've seen uh, the most death and the most destruction. Um, and, and what happened is that these facilities, unlike hospitals, operate very differently. Um, some of them are Medicaid funded. Some of them had two or three patients in rooms. Uh, the staff is low paid. The staff in many instances uh, didn't have enough PPE. They might get infected. And then many of the staff people in these facilities actually worked in multiple facilities. So they'd go from one to another, uh, perhaps infecting patients in multiple facilities themselves. So this has been one of the, the biggest challenges from the get-go in Virginia is trying to address the problems in the long-term care facilities. We've done a great job with the social distancing in some of the neighborhoods and the like, but we haven't done uh, as well with these uh, long-term care facilities there. Um, so that, that, that was sort of the first uh, issue that, that we address, that we had. <clears throat> Secondly, um, <clears throat> what we also saw uh, as time went on here, and I started to look at this, <clears throat> I started to try to see who else was being impacted uh, by COVID and who was being impacted uh, disproportionately by COVID. And what we saw um, is that while social distancing was working with one group of folks, there were other groups who had more trouble social distancing. They might be people, as we said, in long-term care facilities, correctional facilities. We've seen a huge problem in some of them. Um, you know, places that, you know, that I, in fact, I lived in Virginia, I never heard of before, the Dillwyn Correctional Center in Buckingham has hundreds of folks um, who've been impacted. And then folks who work and live in close quarter facilities uh, where they would find it difficult to, uh, in their workplace, to socially distance and find it difficult at home to socially distance. And so uh, in particular, what we see is the Latino community in Virginia has been hit very, very hard and disproportionately. <clears throat> so in this slide, what you see is that the Latino community is about 10% of the entire Virginia population, but they are 44% or 45% essentially of the cases in Virginia. There are 35% of the folks who have been hospitalized 10% um, of the deaths because largely uh, they're a younger population than the folks who've been in the LTCF, the long-term care facilities. And so <clears throat> what you've seen uh, with the Latino community is that many of them work in the, uh, the meat processing plants. In Accomack County on the Eastern shore, about 3% of the entire population has uh, contracted COVID, many of them Latino. In the Northern Valley, uh, what you would find in Harrisonburg, Rockingham, Shenandoah, and the poultry plants, uh, many of them are Latino. And then um, even in, in places that you might not even think of, Culpeper and Galax, uh, similar things have happened. Every time I've seen a spike or an outbreak in a community outside of the major metros recently, I've gone and kind of done some digging with the local papers and the like, and almost invariably I find a fairly significant Latino workforce and Latino population. So the workforce, what you find in both the poultry plants, they're, they're working together, they're cutting up uh, whole chickens for, you know, boneless chicken thighs and the like. And then in, there's this back and forth because they also then go home and often live in multi-generational families. They live together um, and they have issues uh, in which they are then infecting others at home. And this is another place where we've sort of been late to respond. A lot of folks have talked about the importance of testing, which is important, but beyond the testing, there needs to be some uh, capacity to isolate individuals who test positively. And at least right now, we've yet to put in the infrastructure to do that. And so we've seen this uh, very high disproportionate impact in the Latino community in Virginia. And then finally, in the African-American community, uh, we've seen a disproportionate impact, uh, particularly 
Uh, it has about 20% of the state population, about 27% of the, 24% uh, of the deaths. So it's slightly disproportionate, um, but it hasn't had the same kind of case impact that we've seen with the, with the Latino community overall. So that, uh, as, as I've looked at Virginia, what I've seen is that it's been a very uneven situation like it has in most states in terms of the impact. Uh, so in Virginia, the impact on the death has been in the long-term care facilities. With the cases, it's been people who uh, work in these close quarter facilities or live in correctional facilities. Um, and then finally, there's been an impact that's been differential across the metro areas. Um, Northern Virginia and Nova has been hit the hardest in Virginia. It's actually what I call the, uh, the southern tip of the East Coast epicenter that goes from Boston, New York, which is the center of it, uh, down through Maryland, DC, and Nova's right at that tip. And the numbers in Nova have stayed pretty high uh, up to now. Um, while a place like Hampton Roads has had very few cases recently. Uh, yesterday, uh, I think the entire set of communities that I consider on Hampton Roads and the, and the um, peninsula had 24 cases. So again, very uneven that way and uneven when you look toward the western part of the state, which has really not been hit anywhere near as hard. Uh, the Richmond Metro is somewhere in between Hampton Roads and Nova. We probably look a little more like Hampton Roads uh, than we do with Nova. So what's happened now, as uh, most states have had the economic experience of the lockdown, putting the economy in a medical coma, almost every state, including Virginia, is now thinking about how do we come out of this? What do we do to sort of move forward? And how do we find some way of targeting the places that are really problematic and then reopening the economy and using what we might have learned with social distancing to help do that? So we're entering now what I call um, social distancing 2.0. And, and what that means is this, that if you take a, uh, a step back for a second. Um, social distancing, I think, had three major benefits for us. The first is that it clearly did stop the community, the widespread community spread. Um, you know, probably if you live in a suburban neighborhood, you don't have, uh, you know, blocks and blocks of people who have contracted uh, COVID-19. Secondly, while we were social distancing, we learned a little bit more about the disease. We learned about where, where it was most problematic, uh, close quarter indoor facilities, and where it was a little less problematic. Uh, you know, we might recall six months ago, we were, six weeks ago, we were all worried about our packages from Amazon. We went to the grocery store, would we pick it up from uh, what we were purchasing there? That doesn't seem to be the case. So we've learned a little bit, and I think I learned a lot more about where this, um, where this is. And then finally, I think uh, beyond that, we've had the time to think about how we can reconstruct certain operations um, to be more, to be safer. Uh, you know, people are now thinking about how to make for safer workplaces, how to make for um, uh, safer schools. What are we gonna do when kids go back to colleges? And if we hadn't had this six week time, we probably would have been behind the eight ball thinking about that. So as we move forward, um, you know, what we find is that on one hand, there are probably some things that we're gonna benefit from uh, because of what's happened over the last six or eight weeks. I think telehealth is going to be something that is um, you know, far beyond what we've ever seen before. I think we're gonna see more innovation about online education. Um, we've already seen this with Frank Upton's work and terms of uh, reshoring, bringing back to the United States certain critical manufacturing facilities. So those are the things that I think are likely going to be uh, relatively positive there um, on that sense. At the same time, when we think about this, um, the other thing that's now going to happen uh, with social distancing is that as we now move back into reopening, reopening the economy, reopening parts of schools, uh, doing that kind of activity, 
there's going to be more people moving around more frequently. And so what occurs now is that unlike for the last six weeks, all of us individually are going to be making some very serious choices about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Um, we're going to have to decide what kind of risks we want to take, what kind of risks we don't want to take. Um, I did a little piece the other week. I said we're all poker players now uh, in this sense, in which all of us are going to be making these choices. And so if I can move to the next slide, Sam, uh, Stan, if that's possible. Um, here. I'm going to try to do, yeah. Um, and I'm going to, and so there was a national survey yesterday that started to look like this, um, started to ask people these kind of questions about, you know, what, what are you going to do? Uh, and when, and, you know, what do you think is safe? And um, these are the kind of questions we've had you just answer on this survey. But I want to look at the national results. And I want to uh, look at this because it also shows what's also happening nationally with the point of view that people have about COVID-19. And what we're seeing is that partisan politics is starting to shape uh, the manner in which individuals even respond to these kinds of risks and to these kinds of questions. So if we look at the first question, do you think it's safe to go to your workplace? Um, overall, between 50 and 60% of the public say they think it is. 80% of Republicans say it is. About 60% of independents say it is. And about 35% of Democrats say it is. There, there, it turns out that there's this increasing polarization even about what you should do individually. Would you go to a restaurant? About 70% of Republicans would do it. About 40% of everyone would do it. 40% of independents, about 9% of Democrats think they should go to a restaurant. Um, how about to go into your barber? Almost 80% of Republicans think it's okay. About 25% of Democrats think it's okay to go to a salon. Um, the one place where there seems to be relative agreement is that not, uh, there's no majority that wants to get on an airplane right now um, on that. Um, but even here, you see some pretty significant differences uh, between Democrats and Republicans about uh, what they should do. Um, and so this is, this is pretty interesting in some ways, troubling in others, actually, uh, because the last thing I think we want to do is to have uh, science completely contaminated by these polarized political positions. Um, is there any way, Stan, that we could bring up uh, the results from our group here? Yes, yes, there is, Bob. Here we go. Hold on just one second. Okay, so what we find is 36% um, would be comfortable going to the workplace. That's uh, smaller than uh, the national average. 4% would be comfortable eating inside at a restaurant. That's even fewer than the Democrats nationally. 4% would be comfortable going on an airplane. 4% would be, would be uh, comfortable uh, having a child or grandchild attend a summer camp and attending a live on, uh, entrepreneur meeting or other event with 200 plus people, we have 12%. So essentially what we have, at least in this group, is a lot of wariness about going back into that economy. And that's going to be the challenge of going forward as we try to reopen the economy, because you have to reopen it in such a way that you have some public confidence. Um, and, and by and large, that's going to be a very significant challenge going forward. I want to talk just very briefly before I take questions about a couple of the other uh, polarized issues. And if, I could, if we could just move to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, backwards. Hey, Bob. This yeah. is Nancy. Um, unfortunately, people were unable to check multiple things or none at all. So um, just know that if it was none at all, that makes up for the difference in counts. And uh, some people wanted to check all of them. Okay. 
I'm trying to get to the, um, the next slide about the, sh should President Trump wear a mask in public? If we can get there, there. Um, yeah, so this is, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, in terms of the approval rating of President Trump, again, total polarization. Eight, over 80% of Republicans think he's doing a good job, about 40% of ind independents, 11% of Democrats. Um, if we can get to the mask slide, Stan, I don't know if we can do that. Go to the next one. Should the president wear a mask in public? You're going to have that choice today. The Michigan Attorney General said he's coming to a, power, uh, a Ford Motor plant, uh, uh, and he better wear, should wear a mask. We'll see if he does. But again, among Republicans, less than 30, about 30% 30 think he should. Among the Democrats, 90% think he should. And then finally, give me the, the final one about us in masks, Sam. We can go to one more. Um, should all of us be required to wear a mask in public? About 65% of the public think so. About 40% of Republicans, 60% of independents, 80% of Democrats. So, um, you know, what I'm worried about is that by the end of the summer, when you go to the grocery store, half of us will be wearing masks and half of us will be wearing MAGA hats uh, on that. So um, essentially, that's, as I look at going forward, one of, I think, the challenges we have is to find a way uh, to ensure that we, we keep doing the kind of social distancing that the scientists say with, that, that's going to, going to work and going to operate and that we don't wind up in this uh, horribly polarized environment um, that's likely to become more polarized as the uh, election goes forward. But in any case, I think in Virginia, just to wrap up, I think social distancing has worked uh, to some extent. I think the, the two big shortcomings that we've had have been really with the long-term care facilities. And then secondly, uh, with people who work in these close quarter facilities or live in the close quarter facilities, we haven't addressed that as well as we could. Um, going forward to reopen the economy, we're going to have to find a way to convince the public that the, the that social distancing 2.0, the steps that were taken that we've learned about having to limit uh, the uh, infectiousness of the virus, uh, can actually be embraced by the public with some degree of confidence. I'd love to take any questions or comments anyone has. So Bob, um, we have a lot of comments that came through that um, have a concern about whether proper protocols and community compliance will really happen. So many responses in the poll, uh, folks said that they were um, fine with it if actually they felt like their community colleagues were participating with the right safety and distancing, et cetera, protocols. Do you have any commentary on that? Well, it, I think we'll have to see how that works going forward. I actually think in terms of, um, you know, the social distancing so far, um, you know, certainly everybody hasn't complied, but by and large, lots of people have complied. And I think that has prevented in some fashion the kind of spread that we may have seen in some other places, particularly some other urban areas. Going forward, that's my challenge because you know, there's going to be more interaction. The social distancing 1.0 was a pretty blunt instrument. Basically, it said, stay home, don't go, don't leave, uh, don't do much other than go to, you know, the supermarket or, you know, or Home Depot. Um, now we're going to be in a situation where people are going to be asked to return to work. Uh, people, you know, most Virginia colleges are planning on, uh, you know, on-site instruction. You know, they look at those numbers that say there's really been almost no deaths for people under under 30. And they're saying that we could do this if we can have some degree of testing and some capacity to quarantine people who are out there. I think that there's a, a big sense that uh, a lot of people think it would be a horror to, uh, you know, miss another year of K-12 school where, you know, what we find is that online education is great for some people. Um, but for a lot of folks, particularly those in uh, disadvantaged communities or those that don't have broadband, it's not so good. So there's going to be a lot of pressure to open up these schools. So my sense is that 
Um, you know, what we're seeing from governor out of, from governor, and there, there are differences of emphasis, but most of them are trying to find some ways of in social distancing 2.0 to balance how to open more of the educational institutions, the economic institutions of the state while preserving public safety and the concerns that people are expressing about other people are really important because we're now not only talking about our own behavior, we can all stay at home if we have, if we're privileged enough to do that, however, and don't have to be a frontline worker. However, when, you know, in the social distancing 2.0, we're now more dependent on other people. We're more dependent on them. And that's the gamble that we all have to take. How can we, um, you know, preserve ourselves and our families, knowing that we're going to be doing more interaction, perhaps, with some people who don't share our point of view. That's, that's the challenge. And that's why I really think it's so important for all of us to be on the same page and not to have these tremendous divisions about things like wearing a mask, which I think the science is getting clearer and clearer. Uh, that is a very positive feature that not only helps others, but helps yourself. Uh, but if we're divided about that, that's going to be a challenge. Thank you, Bob. Another question was whether you also had any information, and by the way, Bob, just to confirm, because there are some questions on this, all of your data that you've shown is Virginia, correct? No, um, the, okay, let me, let me make a comparison. The, the public opinion data is national. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, a significant portion of that came out of a survey that came yesterday. I, when I, I, I was compiling a lot of uh, the national data, and then there was this wonderful survey that came out of Quinnipiac that almost mirrored some of the questions we had asked. So I, I used that. So the, the public opinion data is national. The, the data about uh, incidents and prevalence is Virginia-based. Excellent, thank you. Also, there were some questions about whether you had some um, awareness in Virginia about some of the splits uh, related to age or education or public health fluency that might be more likely um, some predictors of uh, COVID spread. Yeah, I mean that, um, you know, what, what you're going to find is that there are some demographic differences, certainly beyond political parties. Um, you know, certainly uh, older people are going to be more worried about contracting the disease uh, than younger people are because the implications are, are broader. Um, you know, what we've also seen is that women are a little more risk averse when we talk about some of these issues that we mentioned in social distancing 2.0 than men uh, on that. I guess men play a little more poker uh, and are willing to, willing to gamble a little more on that. Um, you know, so we see those kind of differences. Um, and, and, that, and that's to be expected, that the experience is going to be very different. The experience is going to be very different if you're in, um, in Bedford uh, County or if you're in Manassas City or if you're in the Eastern Shore. Your experience of this is, uh, and, and that's, what, that's what makes it difficult to come up with these statewide and national policies, is that the experience of a pandemic is not impact, doesn't impact everybody in the same way. It's impacted us very differentially. And depending upon how you've experienced it up to now, may, may have something to do with uh, what you think about the risks going forward. Interesting. And I think too, we're talking about the risk for individuals and communities and also the risk for businesses and what they're requiring. I thought it, um, Barbara Joins put out an interesting commentary. She says, our business, a winery requires guests to wear masks when not seated at their table. Interesting industry learning is that guests are selecting where to go based on whether masks were required or not. They had a lot of feedback during week one that guests left places that they did not feel safe. So Barbara says that she and the, her team feel good about the decision, even if it costs them business as one perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important point. And, and, and let's, let's be, um, you know, let's also note that businesses have not been impacted absolutely equally by this as well. When you take, a, you know, I see Jack Berry on the, um, uh, on the line here. And, and what he knows is that when you looked at the national statistics, when those unemployment statistics came out in April, 50% of jobs in restaurant, hospitality, and leisure and travel were lost. 
and um, you know, restoring confidence there is you know, one of the most challenging tasks we have. And it's a really challenging task um, here in RBA. And you know, what I would say is that you know, one of the great advantages we've had and one of the great features is the extraordinary quality of life we have here because of the, the restaurant industry, for example, where we have all of these uh, amazing local entrepreneurs who've been willing to risk everything, um, who've put their heart and soul and their passion in, um, in, these, in these restaurants. And so we probably have more great restaurants per capita uh, than almost any place in the country. And, and look at the hit that they, they are now taking and, and whether they're gonna be able to reopen and how they're gonna be able to reopen and, and, and how, is a, how is a community, are we gonna to try to rescue them to make sure that they can, they, they can remain where they are? Because it's not only something that helps us, it's one of the, it's a tremendous advantage when we try to recruit talent to people from, from other places. We, we, we bring them and we, we're so proud of taking them out and, and showing them what it's like to live in, in, in RVA, which is so fabulous. And so, um, you know, trying to find a way to make that, the, those related industries um, safe so that consumers feel good about going there again uh, is not only a national challenge, but it's one that we should take very seriously because it's such a, an incredible part, I think, of our regional identity. Excellent, excellent. Um, Mark wants to know how you think Virginia is doing in terms of testing, transparency and reporting testing results, and basically letting data and objective criteria guide some of these decisions. Well, uh, testing has not been a, a strong point in Virginia up until recently. We're doing much better on the testing right now, but it, it, it's been kind of a mess. Um, that in terms of the number of tests that we've given, We've been in the lowest quintile of the country uh, for a long time. Uh, we are now, we are now uh, put together, governor put together a task force. We're doing more testing. Our, our test positivity percentage actually statewide, uh, I looked at it the other day, there are only um, four states that had a higher test positivity percentage than we had right now, uh, which again shows that we have um, some ways to go. Uh, on that. I saw it, it went down considerably yesterday. I'm hoping that that was the start of a trend uh, on that front. And then finally, beyond testing, as I said, what you have to do after testing is that you have to have a public health, public health infrastructure that can allow you to find a way to isolate those individuals who have tested positive if they can. You know, I, I live in a, you know, a large, uh, you know, home with a lot of square footage not too difficult for me to isolate. However, a lot of the people who test positive do not live in those kind of environments. And so you have to have a public health and an isolation infrastructure that allows you to do that. In fact, even when we think about the colleges and universities that are opening up uh, this fall, I saw a really interesting letter that Stanford University wrote to all their students, to the president of Stanford, and he said, uh, we're not going to be able to bring all of you back at the same time, he said, because uh, we want to limit the interaction on one hand. And then secondly, he said, we're going to need a quarantine wing in our dorms for people who test positive so that we can then isolate them so they're not uh, infecting all of their roommates and the like. And I think in Virginia, we're just beginning to build that. And that has been one of the huge problems in the Latino community. You've seen this back and forth between some of the employers uh, and some of the advocates about, well, who's to blame? Is it, is it happening at the workplace or is it happening at, at home? And that back and forth has really frustrated me because at, at the end of the day, no matter who's to blame, you have to have a, a process in place that enables you to isolate individuals. Now, whether that's um, opening up old hotels or finding um, you know, places where you can um, you know, establish, uh, you know, quarantine rooms. Um, but some of that is going to have to be done if we're going to actually succeed with testing. So, so testing is important, but it's the other part of it, the tracing and the isolation that eventually allows the testing to be effective. Um, excuse me, Bob, um, this is Stan. We're, um, uh, we just hit nine o'clock and, uh, 
we've told people that we'll try to to keep these events running on time. The good news is about uh, about being virtual is that uh, we that people can stay if they want to without being too disturbed by the people that leave. So I'd like to wrap up really quick. And then uh, if you don't mind, I think you agreed to stay as long as anybody, or well, re within reason, as long as anybody wants to continue to ask some questions. So um, sure. I'll, uh, just if you give me just a second to wrap up and then we'll come back and put more questions. Um, uh, first of all, um, I, I'd like to thank somebody that you most of you have seen today, Lamisa Abur Aburama. Uh, uh, has a, been a good friend of Von Corpenor, is a great technology help. She started with the original software that we had and has helped all the way through this. So thank you, Lamise. Uh, now, uh, our next meeting, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to have, um, uh, we, we've heard people talk about what's obviously missing from virtual is, any, is the interaction and the networking. So we're going to try a format that will allow us to go to um, rooms, so to speak, virtual rooms to um, network and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Uncorpreneur and how we might modify it or change it or innovate to make it more, more find more creative ways to deal with, with what we're going through with this. So um, we look forward to seeing you at that. Um, uh, the bad news, by the way, is that may limit how many people can be involved, but we, but we will we'll work that out. So um, uh, stay tuned for more information and, and if you would like to um, uh, step off now, that'll be great. And if you'd like, and Nancy, I think probably has some more questions. We'll keep going. Excellent. Thank you. So Bob, um, some folks want you to weigh in on a couple of uh, philosophies, um, particularly about the Sweden perspective and the herd immunity kinds of pieces, that, things that are going around in other countries. Yeah, there have you know, been a whole set of different models that are out there. Uh, Sweden has a slightly different model, which was basically um, not locking down the country, uh, implore, you know, uh, advocating that people socially distance, um, but suggesting that at the end of the day, the virus is best contained if 60 to 70 percent of the people develop um, you know, herd immunity eventually because so many people contracted and, and many people would not contract it in a way that would be, um, that would lead to death necessarily. Uh, the results there have been, have been mixed uh, and we're gonna have to see how it works out in the end. Uh, compared to their other Northern European countries, uh, Sweden's had more cases and more death. Um, you know, when you compare it to sort of Norway, Finland, and other countries that are that are similarly situated for sure um, on that sense. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out if there's a second wave and is Sweden somehow um, less um, less uh, less harmed by the second wave. But the, you know, it, it hasn't had the situation that you had in Italy or Spain. Uh, but in terms of the other regional countries, it's probably been a little worse. Um, we've seen countries that have done at least with temporarily, what we think is a better job of uh, controlling and limiting the virus. And, and those have been basically the Asian countries, um, which are sometimes small or sometimes not, but you know, South Korea, uh, Singapore, um, and, and even part of China, where they were able to take, uh, I think, more dramatic and draconian steps on the you know, locking down, um, not only the economy, but individuals, and being extraordinarily aggressive about tracing contacts in way, you know, in, in South Korea, you, if you're infected, they just take your cell phone <laughs> um, and then trace everybody. That's probably not something that could happen in the United States. I've been watching the um, percentage of people who would say they would uh, do that with, if, if Google or Apple come up with that, that kind of technology and capability. And what you see, is that uh, in the United States, there's, uh, because of our conventional and traditional privacy concerns, uh, some substantial resistance to doing that that might be in terms of at least half the population. Excellent, thank you. Um, now this might call on your real superpowers here, Bob, related to both politics and um, data collection and analysis, which you've been doing on the COVID issue. Um, many people have their own opinions that they've said in the chat, but also wondering what you think about 
uh, depolarizing, mask wearing, bridging the political chasm, et cetera, changing and bridging and connecting people in a more united effort. Um, do you have the magic wand for that? No, I mean, I think that's going to have to be done um, largely on a community basis or a state basis. I think that's, you know, um, you know, it's hard for me to imagine that, it, that in some ways we're going to bridge this national divide uh, in an election year. I think that's likely to become worse, not better. I think uh, what we have seen, however, is that most people in most states have been um, fairly positive about their governors. Um, they think their governor's done a good job. And in, in this state, uh, Ralph Northam is getting approval ratings for his handling uh, above 75%. Um, that's probably even a little stronger than I would give because I think we've had a couple of big misses. But ha having said that, um, I think it's through the community influentials, the community leaders about how we're going to respond, um, you know, whether it be uh, the politicians, the chambers, the, the local administrators coming up with uh, things that uh, we, we feel comfortable doing as a community or doing as a state, I think is the way, is, is the one way potentially out of this national polarization, because I, I think there is um, probably more substantial uh, interest in, um, you know, making sure that RVA works well making sure that our businesses can get back. How do we, how do we make sure that our restaurants can, can operate uh, in the best way? So my sense is that's what I would draw upon right now. Uh, the positive parts of community spirit and the uh, uh, allegiance that people seem to be having far more to their states and locality than mayors and uh, administrators than to the, uh, the national government right now, even though um, we're going to require significant financial assistance uh, from the national government at, at, at every level for both schools, uh, local governments, and, and, and state governments. So they're, they're not irrelevant, but in terms of addressing this issue of confidence, we're going to have to do it ourselves uh, in our communities and in our states. Thank you. Um, a couple of people asked about recommended sources to continue to monitor local development, sources that you trust and rely on and uh, that you feel like they can as well, particularly for our own local communities and the Commonwealth. Yeah, for the Commonwealth, the, the best sources that I've seen so far are, are really threefold, I would say. Uh, the first is the um, Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association uh, does a great job of monitoring conditions in hospitals. They have an online dashboard that monitors conditions about how many people are in hospitals, how many people are in ICUs, how many people are on ventilators. Um, that number has actually never been overtaxed and it's remained pretty steady for the last month. I'd like to see it go down, but it, it's never it's never, never surged, but it's gone, gone there. Uh, the Virginia Department of Health has a COVID uh, website as well that has a lot of great information on uh, what's happening demographically, what's happening locality by locality, uh, what's happening in terms of the outbreaks in the um, uh, long-term care facilities and correctional settings. So I like that as well. Uh, thirdly, I don't know if you know um, the Virginia Public Access Project, uh, vpap.org, that uh, David Poole uh, organizes. I mean, he'd be a great speaker for this too. He's a former reporter who has done a remarkable job in putting together this website that uh, began as a website that just tracked campaign contributions. But now what it does is that it provides um, uh, uh, clips every day from newspaper clips from all around Virginia. It provides a lot of charts and data about what's happening on COVID. And um, VPAP is uh, probably um, the best single source of information about what is happening on a daily basis in Virginia, generally in the sort of political and social realm. And, and during this time, it has also uh, put its resources together to try to do some data analysis as well. So those are, are, are three excellent sources about what's going on. Finally, I might say a lot of the local governments have on their own websites, are been tracking their own data pretty well. Um, and, you, and you can go there also.
Excellent, thank you. Um, someone mentioned that they were, um, that cell phone tracing in Haiti had actually been used for cholera epidemic, things like that, which have to do, I think, with some real interesting privacy issues. Uh, any commentary on that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's the challenge that, that we have here. I mean, that, um, you know, a lot of people just, um, you know, you know, in the United States, we have a you know long tradition of privacy and not having that kind of government intrusion, and and also the other thing that's happened is that there's been overall um, a shift in perception of the large tech companies. Um, Twenty five years ago, we all loved them; uh, they were fabulous. They were they were transforming our lives on a daily basis. And, and what's now happened in terms of public opinion is that there's more more skepticism about. Um, what, what's, what's occurred with privacy more generally. And so um, as they come forward with some very innovative solutions here, it runs into, um, um, you know, the privacy issues uh, on that front there. So that's the challenge. Um, I think, you know, at, you know, at the same time, you know, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to find some kind of bridge to either a therapeutic or a vaccine that works and, um, you know, I think a number of people would be willing to give up their privacy um, to help build that bridge in the short term. But uh, I don't see all Americans wanting to do that. I think there's just a lot of skepticism, um, even in some of the communities that are most likely, uh, you know, that have been harmed pretty dramatically by this. Uh, they'd be skeptic skeptical of either big government or big business. Um, having all that information about themselves. We may have, we're gonna to have to find other ways of doing it that I think are more related to um, trusted individuals in the community. I think when you talk about contact tracers and doing that, you're really talking about uh, not bringing in people kind of from the outside or just technology from the outside, but utilizing uh, the influential um, members and leaders in, in communities by community. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute. I have a question about um, uh, excess mortality. Have, there have been some studies about that lately in different countries and a little bit here. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, that usually that's, um, the excess mortality is, is what people are trying to, um, you know, look at in terms of the, 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 the overall death rate. So, um, there's a general feeling among the scientists, um, not necessarily among all the politicians, that uh, the COVID deaths have been uh, significantly undercounted uh, because a lot of people simply died at home, particularly in the states that were, were, were hardest hit. And there had been some excess mortality in, in most states. Now, it, it's hard to attribute all of that to COVID. If some people weren't going to the hospital uh, because of um, their heart issues or their or or, or cancer issues, there may also have been a situation where things that I shouldn't, um, and maybe that attributed to the excess mortality as well. I haven't seen too many good studies that have been able to separate that right now. Um, but certainly there's a general feeling among the scientists that we undercount. And, and, and one of the issues that comes up, and you may hear sometimes, is that um, you know, some people argue, well, it's just like a flu season. And it's a different flu season. And, and I, I, I track that pretty closely. And what I found is that, because um, I, I was shocked when they started talking about how many people died from the flu. Um, and what I found is that that really is an estimation that's a multiplier of the actual number of people who are identified as dying with the flu um, every year, that there, there's a certain identification that's pretty small, and then the multiplier oftentimes is two or three times that. So if you did that for COVID, actually, the, the numbers go way up. Um, but by and large, uh, what I've seen on the excess death is that people think there's an undercount of the COVID death. I haven't seen, uh, 
a good, uh, uh, um, you know, great data showing, you know, what other kind of death may well have occurred um, in which people simply didn't get to the hospital soon enough because they were worried that uh, you shouldn't go unless you had COVID. Okay. Um, uh, I stepped out for a second and you were talking about uh, sources. Did you mention VPAP? Yeah, I did. I, I, I spent some time on them actually. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I was just looking, um, there's a, uh, uh, if I could share my screen real quick here, just to give you an idea of the depth of their, um, their reporting. Can you see that? Yeah. That, no, I think I did the wrong thing there. Yeah, you could get that, you know, VPAP has that, the um, VDH, that's probably from VDH as well. They they have these maps where you can click uh, state by state as well. Uh, they've done pretty well over time in uh, doing this. You know, I, I, ju I just might add that, you know, part of the reporting issues and part of, part of all of this issue is, um, you know, one of the reasons why we probably didn't hit some things is that it's, it's like a public health war and in the fog of war early on, uh, people miss some things <laughs> um, and they get better as they go on. Right. All right. Well, it's uh, 20 after nine and our number of, a, of, uh, of attendees has dropped off quite a bit. So uh, and the questions they have, I think um, we'll probably wrap up now if that's okay with you. That's great. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk with everybody. Thank you. And we'll maybe, uh, hopefully we won't be back because we'll, you'll, you'll be writing your book and this will be over. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. And thanks to everyone. Uh, we will be in touch and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat>